In contemporary history, the origins and escalation of nearly every war can be traced back to media lies. You can check out my Instagram highlight, Media Lies and Wars, for a slideshow containing how fraudulent journalism has sparked most modern wars. It is shocking how many major Western news organizations consistently engage in fraudulent journalism and false reporting and contribute to hundreds of thousands to millions of deaths around the world, yet continue to thrive in business, undeservedly basking in an aura of credibility and excellence. Considering that Israel is intensifying its war rhetoric and actions against Lebanon today, it is crucial to understand that they cannot pursue their agenda without an orchestrated media campaign. I will be discussing the prospects of Israel widening its war against Lebanon in another post. But in this video, I will reveal how the Western media is not only the mouthpiece of Israel and Zionist interests, but how deeply complicit they are in the genocide of the Palestinian people and the war crimes being committed against Lebanon. Their record of journalistic malpractice is egregious. It is an absolute must to expose it, and that's precisely what I aim to do in this video and the next. Off the bat, if you have reservations about the term genocide, and still doubt its applicability to the situation on the ground in Gaza, I encourage you to review the report of the Rapporteur of the UN Human Rights Council titled uh, Anatomy of a Genocide, which details over 25 pages how the threshold indicating Israel's commission of genocide is met. In other words, Israel has committed genocide in Gaza. I would also like to remind you that the highest court in the world, and the only one with both general and universal jurisdiction, the only international court that adjudicates general disputes between nations, confirmed that at least some, if not all, of the acts committed by Israel, putatively genocidal, appear to fall under the provisions of the Gen Genocide Convention. The purpose of the Genocide Convention is to prevent genocide, not wait until it's over and done to sanction it. But we are horrifyingly way past that threshold today. You should also know that Israel was already deemed to be engaged in a slow motion genocide before October 7th. And these are not my words, but rather the words of the 800 scholars and practitioners of international law, including prominent Holocaust and genocide studies scholars who in their public statement released on October 15, titled Scholars Warn of Potential Genocide in Gaza, <clears throat> explained how the pre-existing conditions in the Gaza Strip amount to a prelude to genocide or a slow motion genocide. However, due to the West's direct complicity, we have now been staring a full-fledged genocide in the face for months, peering into the abyss of more than a textbook case. In my opinion, the term genocide has become a euphemism for what is occurring on the ground in Gaza and the West Bank because the technical definition does not account for the maniacal sadism in which the Zionists have been killing utterly helpless human beings protected only by the flesh on their bones in what is so obviously a pleasurable orgy of violence for them and does not account for the completely psychopathic erasure of their epistemic life and the bestial way that they have been eradicating their identity and history and children. This video serves as a damning indictment of the Western media's complicity in the genocide committed by Israel in Gaza and the war crimes committed in Lebanon. As bad as you think it is, I think I'm going to shock you. You've surely heard the expression spread like wildfire. If you wanted to set an entire forest on fire, you would need three things. Ignition, high temperatures, and low humidity. The result is a rapidly spreading wildfire. If you wanted to set an entire people on fire, you also need three things, dehumanization, propaganda, and impunity. And genocide will spread like wildfire. And propaganda, dehumanization, and impunity are elements that proliferate through media channels. And none have assumed this role better than the Western media and politicians who meticulously crafted dehumanizing narratives about Palestinians and Lebanese, amplified Israeli propaganda, and actively lied and concealed 
Israeli atrocities in order for them to continue to execute their maniacal war with absolute impunity, all with the aim to manufacture consent for Israel's genocide in Gaza and subsequent war against Lebanon. We'll delve into the intricate details of how they, they accomplished all three objectives, and I will probably do it in a several-part video series. One theme per video. Today we will start with dehumanization. So let's get into it. Dehumanization. Dehumanization is the deliberate denial of positive human qualities of individuals or groups, often achieved by portraying them as less than fully human. This can involve portraying them as less civilized, less moral, less intelligent, or less capable of experiencing emotions with the aim of justifying mistreatment, discrimination, or violence against them. Dehumanization is intricately linked to an absence of empathy as it pushes viewers to become unable to recognize, understand, and relate to the emotions, experiences, and humanity of the dehumanized person or group. The point of dehumanization is to justify oppression and violence and to rally support for harmful ideologies. How does the media dehumanize the Palestinians? They do two things simultaneously. They frame situations to heighten your empathy for Israelis and dampen your empathy for Palestinians and Lebanese. How? Here are some typical examples, and for every theme I'm going to show you one example, and then I'll expose how often the media does this, okay? So Palestinians have died and Israelis have been killed. Totally different implication of agency. Died. Passive. Act. With no cause. Conveys a lack of accountability. Killed. Victims of intentional harm. Suggesting a potential for justice. Israeli children are butchered. Or murdered. Or massacred. Or killed. These are visceral words emotionally charged, emphasizing the deliberate and violent nature of the act. But Palestinian babies and children who have actually been butchered by Israel, if mentioned, are lives found ended or found dead. Or as in the case of the three Lebanese children who were willfully targeted and burnt alive in their car with their grandmother in South Lebanon by Israel, they are merely victims. So passive, detached, clinical, zero emotional intensity, distancing the reader from the grim reality of Israeli child murder. I quickly want to take you back to this independent headline. We now know that the Hetzroni 12-year-old twins, Liel and Yanai, were killed by the Israeli military during the infamous siege of a house in Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th. Evidence that they were killed by the Israeli army was both corroborated by the Israeli media Channel 12 as well as the only two survivors from that siege on that house. Pause and read the subtitles if you want. Do you think the Western media ever mentioned this? Do you think that article corrected the headline? Of course not. Now, remember six-year-old Hind Rajab, who on January 29th was fleeing Tel El Hawa in Gaza City with her family when an Israeli tank shot at their car and killed her aunt, uncle, and four cousins. The only survivor at that time, other than her, was her 15-year-old cousin, Layan Hamada, who called the Palestinian Red Crescent, PRCS, frantically crying that an Israeli tank was shooting at them. And then we heard the sound of gunfire, and her screaming went silent because she was killed. Listen. Hello? Hello, Her six-year-old cousin, Hind, was then the only survivor in the car surrounded by the corpses of her family members. There is a long phone call with PRCS that was released in which Hind told the dispatcher, (laughs) 
Two paramedics came to rescue her, Yusuf al-Zainu and Ahmad al-Madhoun. But the Israelis shot him dead, and they also killed the two paramedics. Journalists from Al Jazeera's Fault Lines, forensic architecture in collaboration with Earshot, recreated that entire horror scene as the Israeli Merkava tank decimated the Kia Picanto, a mere 13 meters away, and they mapped a total of 335 bullet holes on the body of the Kia and proved that the tank purposely targeted Hind, who's six, and her cousin, who's 15, and the paramedics. Well, this is how CNN reported it. Five-year-old Palestinian girl found dead after being trapped in car. Yes, it's the trapping that killed her. The New York Times, missing six-year-old and rescue team, found dead in Gaza. The Guardian also found dead. And all the French publications, France 24, Libération, TF1, La Voix du Nord, L'Observateur, also said she was retrouvée morte, which also means found dead. Found dead. Maybe a lightning bolt struck her. Maybe she died from boredom. We don't know. But we know that they're doing their best to distance you from the psychopathic reality of Israeli willful child murder. Because these writers are not journalists. They are propagandists. But nobody tops CNN with this one. Propagandist Casey Hunt called the murdered six-year-old child a woman. Uh, we also are just learning at this hour that uh, banners have been hung from the hall. They, re they read Hind's Hall and Intifada. Uh, Hind is a reference to a woman who was killed uh, in Gaza. A woman. She called her a woman. Never forget that conversely, the Western media called the 19-year-old Israeli female soldiers held hostage girls. But the murdered six-year-old Palestinian child, a woman. Moving on. Now look at this exquisite piece of writing by former President Barack Obama, released on May 31st on his social media. That is 237 days into the genocide. A ceasefire alone won't ease the terrible pain of Israelis whose loved ones were butchered or abducted by Hamas or the Palestinians whose families have been shattered by the subsequent war. Obama is the face of liberal Zionism. Israelis are butchered or abducted by Hamas. This describes brutal slaughter, evokes visceral images of extreme violence, implying direct crimes by specific perpetrators. Well, Palestinians are shattered by war. That's much more abstract and less graphic. There's no sense of personal violence. There's no immediate horror. There are no specific perpetrators. It was the ever-fleeting concept of war that shattered them. How did war shatter Palestinians, Mr. Obama? Maybe they had no gourmet dining options anymore. Maybe they had to cancel their golf games. Maybe, and that would be the worst, that they can't get their nails done anymore. Notice also this very tricky word. Subsequent. It's not innocent. He is also a propagandist. He's propagandizing uh, that the focus still is October 7, and the war is a mere response. This is textbook dehumanization, not only through the minimization of suffering, but by unconsciously blame shifting. The former endured one morning of violence, albeit traumatic. The latter endured a literal genocide for nine months. And yet there is a horrendous hierarchy of suffering where the pain of the latter is dehumanized and the pain of the former is very much humanized. So much so that Israelis are only depicted in a very sympathetic light. They are humanized through tactics such as showcasing smiling faces, sharing personal stories, highlighting cultural resemblances, emphasizing individual names. She was a peace activist. He was a Holocaust survivor. This man who was taken hostage maybe looks like your grandfather or your father. This guy kind of looks like your brother or maybe your boyfriend. They could have been your kids. Their lives are celebrated. Their humanity is cherished. And since we are wired to feel strong emotions toward those who resemble us, these strangers become automatically empathized with, which should be the norm of reporting. 
But conversely, Palestinians are nameless, faceless, cold statistics. Cadavers, body bags, graveyards, destroyed buildings, miserable, poor people who live a life so different from yours that you can only think that they're inherently built different, almost like they vibrate at the same frequency of misery. They're so accustomed to suffering, they surely love it. In fact, this wretched place is so far away from your ordinary life, it's totally normal if you didn't empathize with them. I mean, look, he's on his cell phone fleeing on a donkey. When was the last time you were in the company of a donkey? And no, your brother-in-law doesn't count. What does publishing such a photo do in the midst of a genocide? What are we supposed to think? Oh, yes. Donkeys have a remarkable ability to provide emotional support and companionship. Even in the most challenging and genocidal of circumstances, it's so touching to see them helping these poor people navigate through the chaos with so much solidarity. No, none of this is innocent. So you see, these subhumans slaughtered these beautiful humans. It's horrific, right? Well, what is the guttural reaction? Finish them. Finish them. Moving on. Check out this New York Times article opening line. Negotiations around the release of Israeli women and children held hostage in Gaza have centered on an exchange for Palestinian women and minors held in Israeli prisons. Israelis are children, Palestinians are minors, or as LA Times put it, people under the age of 18. You see, children evokes a sense of innocence and vulnerability and care, which is what you, which is what they want to associate with Israelis. But minors and people under the age of 18 tend to be more neutral terms, often used in legal or formal contexts. It's cold, it's distant, which is what they want you to do for Palestinians, to be cold and distant from them. So one is empathic versus detached and impersonal. One is humanization and the other is dehumanization. But at least they mentioned the women and minors, because here is Washington Post not even bringing up the Palestinian women and children. A deal to release 50 women and children held hostage by Hamas in Gaza in exchange for 150 Palestinian prisoners detained by Israel. Do you see what they're doing? Israelis are women and children who are held hostage. The focus is placed on Israeli vulnerability and victimhood, eliciting sympathy from the audience. The Palestinians are prisoners who are detained. It carries connotations of heavy culpability, of wrongdoing, casting them in a negative, guilty, bad people light, even though the overwhelming majority of those quote-unquote prisoners were women and children too. In fact, half were children. And not just that, but of the 300-person list of Palestinian prisoners that was released by Israel during the truce, 233 of them have no conviction. That's three quarters. So there are not prisoners. They are hostages. But the Washington Post won't clarify that because they're not in the business of telling truth. the truth. They're in the business of propaganda and crime whitewashing. Now, you would think these are all one-offs. Oh, no. The Intercept conducted a quantitative analysis showing how major newspapers heavily favor Israel. They collected more than 1,000 articles from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the LA Times. In fact, only two headlines out of 1,100 news articles in the study mentioned the word children related to Gazan children. And this is the deadliest war on children in modern history, with an unprecedented tally of killed children, maybe 20,000 at this point, mutilated children. 17,000 at least have been orphaned. One child is killed or wounded every 10 minutes. And their wounds are not scratches. They are bones poking through their skin. They are amputations. Their eyes are blown off. Their jaws are crushed. Their skin is scorched off of their bodies. Those are the wounded children of Gaza. Ten children are amputated every 24 hours in Gaza as per se the children. The Washington Post employed massacres several times when describing October 7. 
But when they reported on the November siege and series of bombings, who had killed one in 200 Palestinians, they do not use the word massacre or slaughter once. The term, the term slaughter was used by editors and reporters in major Western newspapers to describe the killing of Israelis to Palestinians 60 to 1. And massacre was used to describe the killing of Israelis versus Palestinians 125 to 2. Horrific was used to describe the killing of Israelis versus Palestinians 36 to 4. But it gets more insidious. The Western media does not only want to dampen your empathy, they want to ignite your disgust toward the Palestinian people. You see, Palestinians are framed as barbaric or inherently violent using very insidious methods. You know how the media consistently describes Hamas as a cartoonishly evil organization. They don't even really base themselves on actual things Hamas does. They fabricate horrifying stories about them, like baby decapitators and systematic rapists. I will debunk these lies in another video. All with the aim of instilling fear and disgust in the global audience. Well, simultaneously, they make sure to tell you that Palestinians support this group. Do you see how insidious this dehumanization strategy is? They portray Hamas through the distorted lens of Israel's propaganda, depicting them as diabolical and sadistic. But then they build a narrative of Palestinian political and cultural complicity with them, which reinforces a distorted and dehumanized view of the Palestinian people as a monolithic entity inherently predisposed to violence, extremism, and mass murder. This implication serves to erode sympathy for the Palestinian population, casting them as supporters of criminality, which makes them culpable for their own murder. By demonizing them in this way, the media seeks to justify oppressive measures against the Palestinian population and garner support for genocidal actions taken against them. So, you see, through manipulation, they deceive an already poorly discerning Western audience, thereby fostering ambivalence and uncertainties about war crimes and genocide in the West. You know, people who say, oh, it's so complicated. Aren't both sides wrong? Yeah, but Hamas. Or yeah, but Hezbollah. And I'm not sure if I'm against genocide, if that's how we get rid of a culture of baby killers. All with the aim of providing cover for Israel's psychopathy. The fraudulent actions of Western media have not only covered up for the genocide and war crimes of Israel, but they mostly fueled and accelerated its pace to such an unprecedented degree, resulting in a level of devastation unmatched in history. Do you understand the magnitude of the situation? I have said this before. The fight for liberation is in the West. Listen to me. Propaganda is expensive. It is exceptionally costly to maintain a lie. And it becomes even more expensive as fewer people believe it. And Israel will be ready to wage war forever to protect it, especially that their eternal wars are fully paid for by the West until it becomes too expensive. These same powers once backed apartheid South Africa. One of the reasons why apartheid in South Africa ended is because it became too expensive to maintain. Boycotts and divestments played pivotal roles, and the immense costs of spreading misinformation and propaganda exacerbated the strain. Well, this is even more true today than it was back then. Today, social media has transformed the landscape. You, yes, you now wield unprecedented power in today's digital age. We have what it takes to turn the table. When you find a post that goes against the pro-genocide establishment in the name of liberation for all, you must engage with it. Because that is how you chip away at the resources of the propaganda machine. By commenting, even with just a few words, five words, you increase the cost of those spreading lies. If you want to help combat the falsehoods of governments and media and prevent deceitful narratives from prevailing, you must support alternative voices committed to the truth. It's not even a financial ask. This just means staying active on social media. 
Times are fundamentally different. Do not underestimate the power of your likes and shares and comments. If you can financially support independent media and personas, you should. We are living a watershed moment, and you have the power to lead it. Apartheid and genocide will not be normalized. Not on our watch. Make sure you let them know. Thank you for your support always. Onwards and upwards.